Yeah. Um, thank you, Rosemary and Jenny. Um, th that certainly touched home with me. The personal, I mean, put it more personally, <coughs> just as the numbers did. <coughs> because um, this has become, I am no longer an adjunct. Too old. Um, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, but uh, it, it's part of a larger tragedy that goes on around me. People I am very close to. And I've, I've gotten to the point, I mean, you give me some hope of just saying, get out of this. You know, you love to teach. They've got you by the service ethic. And they'll hold on to you. And, and I can understand that. But, you know, you, 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 these are people often who then become homeless or, you know, are, are just crashing with relatives or something like that. And I, I see it. It's heartbreaking. But just to step back a tiny bit, um, society, our society in general that is economically polarized more and more. The university is um, a citadel of inequality in many ways. Um, and a model, uh, a miniature of what's going on. I sort of began to pay attention to these issues in 2000 uh, when uh, some students at Harvard, of all places, started organizing in support of the janitors who were all trying to organize into a union. And the janitors were making, I believe, $6 an hour. So the, the thing, one of the things that just stuck in my mind, you know, from the, the reports from the student organizing committee or labor uh, support committee, was that uh, they found that certain, some of the cleaning staff in the dormitories uh, went, would go through the garbage that the students left behind to find, you know, takeout containers that still had some Chinese food left in them because you could take that home for your kids if you got them fast enough. And I just, whoa, you know? Um, meanwhile, at the other end at Harvard, you had um, a guy named Greg Manku, A-M-A-N-K-I-W, -A I believe, who was a, an economics professor who made it his mission to point out why low-wage people could not have higher wages. Uh, you know, it just it would destroy the economy, pure and simple. I once debated him on on the radio, and um, I, at, in the years that I've spent since 2002 traveling around the country talking about these issues with at different college campuses, I began to get the impression that the whole purpose of economics departments is to teach kids that whatever is going on in the economic status quo is perfect and how it has to be. So shut up. And, you know, because it'd be a student, you know, some frat guy stand up and say, well, we learned in economics, blah, 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 you know, you can't, can't raise wages, but, you know, I could make 100000 or whatever. Anyway, I, um, I, I began to get really um, impatient uh, to, to, and even in some places to go so far as to say, what the hell do they teach at this university? Do they teach math, for example? Because if they taught math, you could figure out that on $6 an hour, you're not going to live anywhere in the environment, environs of Cambridge, Massachusetts, or any other probably major university. That's simple. But, um, you know, the, the question that I'm going to put forward just uh, for this conversation is what are the pedagogical implications of this huge inequality uh, at universities and other places of higher education. Now, the old idea, which I grew up with, and I think we all did to an extent, was that the university represents a meritocracy. And so um, people who are earning like six figures and more, that's because they have more, quote, intellectual capital than other people. They have gathered up this stuff called intellectual capital, which entitled them to make so much more money than, say, a food service worker or a maintenance worker um, or anybody. But 
I, I think we're at a, a kind of a, a turning point in terms of this um, citadel of inequality because the meritocracy defense doesn't work anymore. It just, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's fallen apart from so many, and I will, well, I'll point out three ways you can think, about, think of more. Um, one, it seems to me, is the outrageous um, salaries of college presidents. Now, they, they were, you know, sort of at the upper end of the professional level at one point. No more. They're somewhere else. I, I, um, I have some run-ins with college presidents in the course of my campus tours. Um, but I, the one I will never for, forget is um, I was left to be entertained by the president's wife for a few hours in her mansion. And this is their mansion, I should say. And this is a, a rural college with a sort of working class, largely white student body. So, yeah, mansion, okay. Um, I'm not going to describe it because I can't. I don't even have the words for these things. There's just one thing that I will never forget. After we'd been through the many living rooms and what are there, you know, the high arched foyers and everything, and we went upstairs. And she said, and then there's a the guest bedroom, this and that. And then there's a kitchen and, and dining area here, upstairs. That's in case anybody needs a snack in the night or whatever. And I thought, so we've really got one house on top of another. That's amazing. Uh, so the, 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 it's not only presidents, of course, it's, it's football coaches and others. You know, there, there, is, there is sort of some one percenters are in the mix here uh, that has the food service workers and, of course, the adjunct. But I think one of the biggest things that has undermined the meritocratic defense of academic hierarchy is the, precisely the, um, the rise in the adjunct population. I mean, it, what it says to me um, is that here, you know, the idea was if you were well-educated and you had published a lot of papers or whatever it takes, you really had this something special that had to be rewarded. But what's going on with adjunct is that you have practically identical credentials, usually, and achievements, and you know, ability to teach or whatever. You have to have a love for a huge love for teaching, obviously, to be doing it. Um, and yet, you're not worth anything. I mean, just the, the, right there goes one of the basic sort of pillars uh, that in defense of our unequal economy. People are not rewarded on the basis of what they bring to the situation. And they're just laughing at us when they say, all right, you, Rosemary, you get, um, you know, six figures, and you, Jenny or whoever, you know, you are going to get what amounts to less than the minimum wage uh, for your work. So I think they kind of shot themselves. And I mean, if we, if the more we push on this, the better. I think it's becoming apparent to some students that adjuncts are not, I mean, they may be wonderful teachers and everything, but no, they're not around for you. They can't be. They're whizzing off to their other job. And, uh, you know, to, to see what's going on. We have uh, the Economic Hardship Reporting Project that Leo mentioned uh, that I work with uh, has a sort of a, a, a bestseller story out um, last couple of weeks. Um, actually started in Elle magazine, but it's going around more and more places. About, um, you know, a, a, an adjunct with a daughter who um, is on public assistance and um, can't get health care and on and on. You know, you, you know the story. You live the story. So. We, it, it, we're just sort of stunned at how much this is being picked up. And I think there's a, a, a third reason why the whole meritocratic uh, defensive academic inequality isn't working. And that is, bit by bit, students are figuring out that they are going nowhere but to the precariat. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first started bringing that kind of subject up and speaking to student audiences. They did not like it. You know, who is this, you know, grump? 
uh, of course we, we will succeed and everything. All right. <laughs> um, more and more it, there it has come back down to them or come, you know, the, the stories have come, come back that uh, what you're getting out of this is primarily a huge debt. And then there, you, there are not many guarantees after that. So um, i just say none of this makes sense. We're looking at a kind of um, institution, institution that is in a way um, you know, on its last legs. The higher education. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm all for it. I'm not being um, anti-intellectual or anything. I don't want there to be colleges, schools, and I want everybody to be able to go to school as often, much as they want throughout their lives. But what we have as an educational system within our highly unequal uh, and obviously capitalist economy is not something that's going to last because it doesn't make sense at all, not to the students, not to the bulk of the workforce. Um, so I think this is maybe a good moment to really, really challenge the things, them on the things we're talking about and bring out the hypocrisy and talk not only about the workplace unfairness or the workforce unfairness, the exploitation that this represents, but also to talk about what kind of models universities set? Uh, you know, the students who pass through them think they are coming close with the very finest of civilization in some form. You know, that they're, they're getting their brush with Western civilization, uh, which it usually means. Um, but what exactly is being impressed upon them? That unfairness is okay? that hierarchy doesn't have to make any sense at all, that economic hardship, that poverty doesn't have any explanation or justification. Okay, let's press on those issues. Let's press on the complete uh, irrationality here.